Q, you on eight? Two on eight. Okay, you're clear. Stand by for your base. Welcome back to EMS Cast, the show that brings high level advanced education to you, the providers on the street. We're your hosts. I'm Matt Mendez. And I'm Ross Orpit. And today we're talking online medical direction. Is that like when I Google a medical condition I don't know while I'm working in the emergency department? No, not exactly. Close though, right? <laughs> Actually, no, not at all. Uh, online medical direction, this is a concept we're all forced to learn in paramedic school. And initially, it seems kind of esoteric. But really, I think once we define it, it makes a lot of intuitive sense. I brought back EMS medical director extraordinaire Whitney Barrett to explain it to us and why it is so important we talk about it. So online medical direction is real-time medical direction. It's your medical director or their designee that is available 24-7 to answer questions and assist with patient care decisions. Great. Thanks for teaching us that, Ross. We'll see you guys next month for some more advanced level education. All right, Matt. All right. I get it. The communication <laughs> chapter in paramedic school was no one's favorite. But just hear me out why I think this topic is actually really important and why I brought Whitney in to talk about it today. Online medical direction, no matter what it looks like to you, is a pivotal moment in a call where you have identified a need or a question and are looking to elicit a specific answer. I think we've all been on that call where we were asking for a specific time-sensitive medicine, and for whatever reason, the person on the other end of the line just couldn't understand why we needed that and why we were asking for it. Yeah, I know I have. Now, why was it that they couldn't understand what was so clear to us in that ambulance, especially when I don't have the time to ask a second time, or there are three other things I'm trying to get done in the next 10 minutes before I get to the hospital, and I don't have the mental capacity or time to answer five questions about what's going on? Where are we failing, and how can we get our point across quicker and clearer? That's what I want Whitney to help us understand today. All right, you sold me at least. Not sure about our other three listeners, but I'll field their complaints when they troll us on Twitter. What does Whitney have to say? One of the things that I like to think about is sort of the anatomy or the structure of the call. In the same way that the patient care report has specific structure to it um, that can be modified based on the case, medical direction contact should have an organized structure. And if you're in a system that doesn't contact the biophone very frequently, this might be something that isn't trained on very much, but I think is really important and really helps us organize our thoughts as well as something that helps your listener prepare to help you best. So we'll walk through this in the order that we train here in Denver. And it might there might be a slightly different convention that you use in your system. But I encourage you to have sort of a structure and and stick with that because that really helps that redundancy and structure really, really helps with communication. One way to think about this is sort of broken down as directive, descriptive and informative. Directive. This is what I'm calling for. Descriptive. This is the patient I have. Informative. These are the objective findings I have. And I think at the end of your call, it's a good idea to repeat the directive. In other words, say, so can I have what I'm calling for? I first heard of this concept as it applied to fighter pilots and the structure they use to as quickly and clearly as possible communicate information. I think this type of communication translates really well when communicating information to online medical direction, or even when communicating information to a team member while running a code or resuscitation of a critically ill patient. For more discussion about this communication technique and its translatability to emergency medicine, go check out MCRIT episode 99, where Scott Weingart chats with Joe Novak, a former F-15 combat pilot, now emergency medicine physician. For the full episode, we'll have a link in the show notes, but now let's get back and hear what Whitney has to say on the topic. First of all, identifying yourself is really important. Who you are, who, what agency do you work for? Are you ALS or BLS? This can be really helpful for your listener to sort of know what to expect then, right? So this is EMT Barrett on Denver Health Ambulance 23 is one straightforward way and it provides a lot of information. Checking to make sure that they can hear you is always a benefit because if you launch into a whole story and you've never confirmed that somebody can hear what you're saying, frequently that results in you being frustrated, hanging up and having to call back and say all of the same things again. I'm calling to get a mean drip. I'm to a 
Sorry, you're in the, I'm only catching like every fifth word. And then I think one of the most critical pieces is to state why you're calling. Directive. You've identified yourself. I'm calling for a whatever, a consult, a pronouncement, a refusal, I'm calling for a setup. You get the idea of sort of all the different things. But give your listener a brief pause here to then make sure they have a moment to sort of prepare themselves for what the rest of this is. For example, when I take a phone call and I hear from our medics, hey, I'm calling for sort of a complicated consult here. I immediately know that what I need to do is sort of settle myself where I'm at and get ready to really engage in this conversation. Whereas if, you know, I hear the lights and sirens in the back and it says I'm coming emergent to you guys with a trauma patient, that's a totally different thing. I'm listening much more briefly for those key pieces of information I need to then set up our emergency department. So giving that sort of setup statement, I think is really, really helpful and important. And then moving on to provide sort of the pertinent information for the context of your request or why you're calling. Descriptive. Picking the information to include or not include here is actually one of the most difficult parts of these calls. And it actually takes a lot of practice. Like anything that is important, the more you practice it and the more you're you do diligent practice, uh, the better we get at it. But the information that is most important sort of always is things like age of your patient, gender, the reason why you might've been called there or sort of what your chief complaint might be. And, uh, and then a set of vitals. It is rare that a set of vitals isn't super important to communicate what's going on with your patient. Deciding what information to provide can be very challenging. Does Whitney have any tips for how to best do this? Yeah, you know, we talked about this during our intro to how to give a good handoff. And I was definitely interested in if Whitney had any tips. So I asked her. So my first recommendation is to stop and take a second to think before you make the call. As part of my EMS fellowship, we went through our field training program here in Denver. So I have functioned as a paramedic and I was a pretty bad paramedic actually, but I do remember very clearly my first call to the biophone and I knew I needed to call the biophone. So I dial it in my phone and I pick it up and the person on the other end answers. And I suddenly realized I had no plan for what it was I was gonna say. I knew sort of where I wanted to get to, but I hadn't thought at all about how I was gonna get there. And so I think taking that thoughtful pause, it might take 15, 30 seconds to think a little bit about what it is that you want and how you're gonna get there. It can be super, super important. I think it's awesome that Whitney got to experience making these calls from the street during fellowship. I remember when I was a paramedic and had to make my first call into medical control, as soon as the doc picked up, I froze and I realized I had no plan for what I wanted to say or ask for. We're going to listen to a clip of a call Whitney received as the medical control physician. The EMS provider struggles like we all have at one time or another, but that just illustrates how hard this part of the job is. This is Barrett. Yeah, this is uh, Eric on Denver 15. Uh, calling for possible sedation on an 11-year-old. Right now, he's uh, able to be verbally calmed down. But just in case, I'd like to have the order for transport in case I can't control him verbally. Sorry, you're asking for what? Uh, sedation for a possible combative 11-year-old. Okay, um, and then what would be your choice of what you would want to use to sedate the patient? Or is that what you're asking me, what I would recommend? No, yeah, we're probably like Versed, probably in my am. Okay, so uh, if you are unable to control him verbally, then yes, you can give a dose of IN. Versed, so intranasal Versed, um, by dosing in your hands heavy book for an 11 year old. Correct, yeah. I think I would like I am. Okay. Rather than I am. Yeah, okay. I think I am fine. Uh, she's crying, e- okay, you know, in a little bit, so. Either okay. way. E- either either one is fine, I'll leave that to your discretion, but um, I am would be my. Intranasal would be my first choice, but if you feel like intramuscular is a better choice for the patient, that's fine. And uh, okay. yeah, then just double check your dose um, in the hand heavy. Okay, excellent. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks. Winnie does an awesome job here navigating this call. There's a point where abbreviations start to get confusing and she astutely uses intranasal instead of IN because there was an obvious disconnect. This highlights two key points. 
Be prepared before you call and don't use abbreviations. Once you start thinking about what you want to say, you realize that the pieces of information you need to communicate become a little bit more clear. And so to illustrate this, I'd sort of like to go through a couple different examples. For example, if I'm calling for a termination of resuscitation, that is my end goal is I want to be able to communicate with the person on the phone that the person that I'm taking care of, I've done my best to resuscitate them. And I think that transport to the hospital is futile and I'd like to pronounce them. And so what pieces of information associated with this call are going to be most helpful to communicate that? Informative. Some of it's easy because it's the stuff that you that's in your protocols, right? The protocols that, that allow you to even make this phone call. But sort of the duration of time you've been working your arrest, was it a witnessed or an unwitnessed arrest? any shocks that were provided, uh, the current rhythm of the patient, medications that have been provided, the airway that might be in place. Sometimes in tidal capnography is a piece of information that can be helpful. As you tie all that together and present it to the person on the phone, it is much more likely that they'll understand what you're describing to them. It will be equally clear to them that this is a person that shouldn't be transported to the hospital and should be pronounced in the field. And, you know, they'll say, yeah, that sounds like a very reasonable plan. And they'll give your time of pronouncement. Details that probably don't matter, right, is that you move the patient from the bedroom onto a hard surface and things like that. While that's super important, those probably don't help your listener understand what happened with this resuscitation. Hey, Dr. Smith, this is EG21 calling in a termination of resuscitation efforts. Okay. Hey, I'm here with a 99-year-old female. Um, she's got some in-home health care here that said the last time she spoke was at approximately 17, 20 hours this evening. DPD arrived, or excuse me, DFD arrived, found her uh, apneic, started CPR and uh, rescue breathing for her, put her on the monitor. She's in PEA right now at about 28 beats per minute. We're not feeling any pulses. We've been doing CPR for 20 minutes. She got three rounds of epi. She got D50. She got Narcan. She's intubated at this point. Her initial end title was 27, which remains for a short period of time, and it's slowly been dwindling, and we're now down to about five or six with a good waveform, good lung sounds, no epigastric sounds, and we'd like to terminate at this point. Uh, let's see here, time of pronouncement, 1811. 1811, thank you. The final thing that I would say is using closed loop communication to end your call. It might feel redundant, but sort of the, okay, doc, I got a time of pronouncement for... 1230 or thanks, we'll see you at Denver Health in five minutes. This can save a lot of trouble later because as we see examples, when you have left it as I'm going to Rose and somebody else heard Joe's and nobody has closed the loop to say, I'm going to set you up at Rose Hospital or St. Joseph's Hospital, uh, you can imagine sort of the downstream effects of some of those things. We'll just take another sort of brief example. So if you're calling to set the hospital up um, for a critical patient that you're bringing, your end goal is you want to have the resources available there in the hospital for that patient at the bedside, just waiting for you, right? So if it's a trauma patient, you want to let them know it's a trauma. You want to provide the objective information that is that you have available to communicate how sick this person is. Are they hypotensive? Did you have to intubate them? Things like that, their level of alertness. Sometimes their mechanism of injury can be in important. You don't necessarily need to detail all of the injuries that you've found, but any sort of unique factors uh, that might be relevant. Is the patient pregnant? Things like that can totally change the resources that, that are available to your patient when you arrive at the hospital. Yeah, another thing that's super important to stress is just to remind providers to always be honest. I think it might sound a little ridiculous, but it's, it's very important. There's a lot of pressure, especially with pronouncements and refusals and things of that nature to just try to make everything really straightforward for the listener. But sometimes the case just isn't straightforward and it's, it's okay to let people know that, you know, it's still important to be organized, be clear with your question and start up front with exactly what you're calling for. But if the situation is messy, the next move isn't as obvious as you would hope. It's, it's super important to get that advice and collaboration with the online medical direction to kind of just help you take better care of the patients. Absolutely. I think one of the most helpful things I hear on the phone is I'm calling for a whatever, and this is a little bit complex. I'm going to need your help as we walk through this. And that just really allows you as a listener to be like, okay, let's, I'm going to put my creative thinking on or, or whatever else needs to happen. 
And don't be afraid to ask for feedback. You know, obviously this maybe isn't always feasible when you're actually on the phone call with the person, but later on when you drop the patient off or if you run into that individual or even just asking your supervisors to pull that phone call and give you feedback is super helpful and helps you become better. Yeah, I actually had an experience in the emergency department just the other day where um, a medic, one of our new medics had called in and the biophone was a little bit rocky and I probably didn't set the department up as well as I could have had I had a better understanding of what was going on. And part of that was on me because I didn't actually ask the important clarifying questions while I was on the phone. But it was great because when they got here, they quickly recognized that we weren't appropriately prepared. (laughs) And we were able to have a really good conversation about sort of what information they could have provided that would have helped me understand sort of the situation they were in, um, that it wasn't just two patients they were bringing, but they actually had four patients in their <laughs> ambulance. <laughs> and, and some of them were pediatrics and and things like that. When your um, ambulance literally <laughs> turns into a bus. And, um, and then at the same time, too, to understand sort of from their perspective, things that made my communication uh, less than ideal. Yeah, so, just, just like you said earlier, it's a two-way conversation, right? Absolutely. So this seems easy enough. You take a pause before getting on the phone to organize your thoughts. You be honest about what you're dealing with. Get feedback at the end of the day to make yourself better. Communication is honestly really important in EMS. We talked about this in our handoff segments. It's one of the most important things we can do. It is something we're going to cover a lot, but there are, are there any other tips you would pass along regarding biophone communication at this time? Yeah, and you know... <laughs> I'm so glad that you guys are spending the amount of time that you are talking about communication, because when you look through the books, frequently what you see is things about using radios and hertz and channels <laughs> and not as much Super about important. <laughs> not as much about how we actually communicate with one another. But I think the one that's super important is to avoid jargon and abbreviations at all cost. Even though it might be something that's super comfortable for you and you're sure that everybody understands what you're saying, sometimes that comes back to bite you. So using the full names of hospitals, using the full names of medications, assume that the person that is answering the phone, that it's their first day operating in your system. And so like for us, right, you don't say I'm going 10 to 5 which might not mean anything to somebody, Uh, you would say I'm coming emergent to Denver Health. It's not that many more words and and it makes it that much more clear. Versus I'm saying I'm going to the U, which means, oh, you're coming to me? No, 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 I'm going to the U. Wait, who? Absolutely. And then the wrong hospital is set up and all sorts of things. Another thing to always remember is, we mentioned it before, is just that closed loop communication. Um, If the person who's on the phone with you doesn't do it, then it's up to you, right? So if you're asking for medications, repeat back what it is that they just told you you could give. And those critical pieces of the call. So even if you're 99.9% sure that you heard it right, those key pieces are really important to just read back, hear back. And then most importantly, and this is something that I've learned after listening to a lot and a lot of biophone calls, is that when you get to a point in a call where you're frustrated and it's obvious that the person on the other end of the line is also frustrated, that's an important time to actually stop and start over rather than assuming that whoever you're talking to is just dumb. It's really hard to do. We frequently just want to get frustrated because inevitably this is over a really critical patient that you're trying to do the best you possibly can for. But instead of when you want to say, are you an idiot, stopping and saying, okay, let's actually start over. Like, here's my situation. I'm calling you for it and just start from the beginning. Don't use the exact same words, right? Because those same words were the ones that got you where (laughs) you were. Um, But think about, can you frame this in a different way to help your listener understand what it is that you're dealing with? Because usually you're both trying to accomplish the same thing, which is the best thing for the patient that's in front of you. And sometimes it's just really hard to get there when you're looking at a patient and you're talking to somebody who's miles away in a totally different situation and just trying to put all the pieces together. I think that regardless of what level of provider you are or where you're practicing, there's some really important pieces of biophone or online medical direction uh, communication. 
I should also say that while we focus on the pre-hospital side of this, I actually can't emphasize enough how important it is that the people answering the phone, the doctors, the nurses, or whomever, are also equally well-trained. I review a ton of biophone calls actually as part of my job, and it's rare that problems encountered during online medical direction are only because of one side of that communication. And so it's it, both pieces are equally important. As a pre-hospital provider, if you're having problems with the responses you're getting, I really encourage you actually to go through the appropriate channels to give the feedback to whoever it is that's answering the phone for you. Because this is, this is feedback that should totally go both ways. It should never just go back to pre-hospital providers about ways they can be doing better. 